Welcome to chapter 17. In this video we are going to talk a little bit more detail about the brightness of stars and the colors of stars and how astronomers actually talk about these things and measure them. So the first thing we need to understand when we're talking about how bright stars are is that there are two different things to consider. There is how bright stars look from our view here on Earth and how bright stars physically truly are no matter what our distance is. So the first is called apparent brightness. It is based on our view of stars looking bright in our sky or stars looking dim in our sky. And the second thing is called absolute brightness. And we'll introduce it in a couple of slides um, with the alternate term luminosity. Now, an object can appear bright to us if it is close by or if it is inherently bright, and sometimes both. Imagine, for example, a small little pen light on a keychain. If someone is shining that right in your eye, it will look extremely bright. But if they are down the hallway from you shining it, it won't look that bright at all. It, on the other hand, if we have a huge spotlight, like at a theater, that will look extremely bright even if you are kind of far away from it. So the reason that the sun outshines all of the stars in our sky and creates the daytime versus the nighttime is because it is so close to Earth compared to all of the other stars. It is not actually all that bright a star when we compare it to all, the, all of the possible stars that are out there in the sky. Astronomers sometimes use a unit called magnitudes to measure brightness, and so it is worth us making sure we understand what this unit is trying to tell us. Now, the magnitude scale is based on star catalogs from the Greek scholar Hipparchus. His name came up very briefly in our chapter two slides when we talked about who discovered precession because that was Hipparchus also. But Hipparchus came up with this um, catalog scheme for determining star brightness by putting them into category one for the brightest stars and category two for the next brightest down to category six, which were almost too dim to see. But if you looked out of the corner of your eye, you could probably see them. And so he had these six categories. When modern astronomers tried to take this same system but quantify it a little bit better, what they realized was that some stars that were in that category one were actually brighter and needed their own category. And since we'd already used the numbers one through six, the only way they could go is backwards. And so category zero became even brighter, category negative one, and so on. That leaves us with a kind of weird unit that is a quantifiable difference between category two and category three, but it means that extremely bright objects have a negative number. The sun in the daytime sky is a negative 26 in magnitude. It outshines everything else astronomy can give us. When the moon is full, which means it is completely lit up from our perspective, it's about a category negative 12 or negative 13, also extremely bright. The only other things that are um, significantly bright like that are objects in our solar system, Venus at its brightest point, Jupiter and Mars, because those things are close to us and that's what makes them bright in our sky. The single brightest star in our nighttime sky is Sirius. Sirius is at about a minus two, and stars from there um, get fainter and fainter, getting into the positive numbers, the original goals of the magnitude scale. And a positive six is about the limit that the human eye can see without a telescope. If you continue to look at the image here, which is also from our textbook, you can see that with binoculars, you can get down to things that are as dim as a plus 10. With a one meter diameter telescope, you can see things down to about plus 18 or plus 19. 
With a four meter telescope, bigger telescope means more light gathering power. We talked about that in chapter six. You can see things down to positive 26 and so on. So we need to recognize that magnitude is a unit to measure brightness. Okay, so apparent brightness can be measured by um, magnitude scale. It can also be measured in units of energy flux. This is basically, for apparent bright brightness, it is basically telling us what is our telescope collecting? Every single second, how many photons is it collecting? How much energy per second? Absolute brightness, on the other hand, is the true actual brightness of an object. So a star will be brighter if it is producing more energy every second. This is what we refer to when we use the term luminosity. It showed up once in our chapter 16 slides. It's going to show up a bunch in our chapters 17 and 18 slides. Luminosity is telling us the power of a star, how much energy per second is produced um, by that star. Now, luminosity cares about a couple of things. And when we compare luminosity, the true brightness of the star, with apparent brightness, what our telescope sees, the difference is how far away that telescope is from the star. Now, this particular picture is from chapter five of our textbook, when we are introduced to the idea of the inverse square law. I saved it for chapter 17 because we didn't really need it until now. But what we can see here is that the farther and farther away we are, if we imagine each of these light blue or teal squares as being a telescope detector, if we are a distance one away, the telescope will detect a certain number of photons. Let's say 36 photons every second. If we put it twice as far away at a distance of two, we would need four of those telescopes to collect everything, which means each telescope, instead of seeing 36 photons, is now only seeing nine because those photons are spreading outwards. Again, farther away means we need nine entire telescopes to collect all of those photons and each of them sees only four photons every second. We don't need to get into the math of this, but we do need to recognize that getting farther away from an object decreases the brightness much faster than just a linear scale. This is proportional to the distance squared. Okay, back to luminosity. Absolute brightness or luminosity is based on two factors for a star, just two. How big that star is and how hot that star is. This equation, although it looks complicated, I need us to take a breath and recognize that it is just trying to tell us in a small math equation what we could also say in a couple of paragraphs of text. So it is meant to be a thing that concisely summarizes how these terms are related to each other. So I will say in words what this means. L is the luminosity. It's the total energy output per second. It cares about the surface area of the star. 4 pi r squared is the surface area of any sphere. The thing that matters is the radius of that star. A big star produces more energy. A small star produces less energy overall. And then the orange colored part here, sigma, which is just the Greek letter sigma, and that's a constant we don't have to look up, times t to the fourth, that is based on black body radiation and how black body radiation actually works. We mentioned that term back in chapter five, we just didn't talk about sigma t to the fourth, but that is how much energy is produced on each patch of a star's surface, and it is based entirely on temperature. So a hot star will produce a lot of light and a cold star will produce very little light. This is really important for us to recognize here. We can have a star be bright because it is big or because it is hot. 
Some stars are really bright because they are big and hot. Some stars are really dim because they are very small and very cold. We will see all of these different situations occur. Now let's go back to how temperature and color is related. We talked back in chapter five about how stars tend to look either bluish or reddish. And the link here in the posted slide PDFs is a um, physics education tool. It's a simulation that allows us to change the temperature of a star and see what color it looks to us. We also saw this image back in the chapter five slides that the way that these black body curves work, we really don't see any green stars because all of the red and blue kind of washes out. If we take a picture of stars, we will be able to see color differences, even if we're just taking a picture in visible light. In this picture here, we can see some stars that look a lot redder and some stars that look kind of a whitish, almost blue color. In our semester, we will just use the words bluish and reddish to describe hot stars and cold stars respectively. It is worth noting though from our textbook that there is something called a color index that astronomers use to actually quantify that information. Hopefully we recognize that bluish and reddish aren't that scientific sounding. In this other picture here, which I'm gonna um, leave us with as we finish up this particular, particular section, we can see in the star trails objects that clearly look redder and objects that clearly look a little bit bluer. It is worth our understanding that stars do truly have different colors and that color is based entirely on the temperature of those stars. So we will pick back up in chapter 17 with our next video, but for now we hopefully have a better sense of what we can talk about when we talk about star brightness. We have to distinguish whether we mean how bright they look in the sky, and even this picture here, we can tell stars that look brighter and look dimmer just from this um, particular diagram. And separately we talked about colors of stars, which is mostly a reminder of things we talked about back in chapter five. So I will see you in the next video.